We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask a Bellhop. Uh, social media works too, of course. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to come through the website so that they don't get lost and I get a nice notification on my phone and all that. I'm not going to say no, though, to a question asked anywhere out there on the web. So right now, as we record the show, um, everyone listening to us live and everyone who's listening to this on Tuesday is sure well aware, but just in ha case you happen to be listening to this in the, in the future at some point, going through our backlog, uh, we are in lockdown. Actually, everyone in Ontario is in lockdown due to the COVID-19 virus, which is spreading like wildfire all over the world. Now, so far, the two of us and our families are perfectly fine, but we are doing our part by staying home and only going out when absolutely necessary. And what we do, practicing social distancing when we do. Now, this is a tough time for people with a lot of uncertainty and confusion. And for many people, uncertain futures with their sources of income gone. As yeah. gamers, we already understand the power of games to help distract, de-stress, and, if only for a little while, help us forget about problems elsewhere. Games yes. are important, perhaps even more so during these uncertain times. Yeah, because here in Ontario, restaurants and bars are shut down. All local facilities are shuttered, libraries and everything. Libraries are closed. Most retail outlets are doing delivery or special orders only or having you pick up at the door. Pretty much all the game conventions have been canceled, everyone for March at least, most of the April ones. And well, all the local gaming events are on hold until further notice. Yeah, studies just released uh, yesterday indicate that this isn't going to or shouldn't end anytime soon. Precautions of some form will need to be in place for extended periods to ensure that the virus remains contained until vaccinations are available. But all that doesn't mean that we can't get some gaming in. And I think it's a very healthy thing to do. As Sean mentioned, this is a great way to distract yourself from what's going on in, in the world, uh, a way to a shelter from all of the bad news and all, all the, the distress. Like, I think this is actually the perfect time for people to do some gaming with their families and others isolated with you. Now, having all this time, to me is an indicator that this is a good time to get in some longer games, some epic games you normally wouldn't have time through, to, to play through. It's also a great time to play through that legacy game or campaign games that needs the same group week after week and would normally take you a long time to finish. I also think it's a good chance to try gaming outline, uh, gaming online, sorry, outline, uh, playing RPGs through conference software or any of the many sites designed to support it and playing board games through apps or Steam or some of the sites we just mentioned in our last section. Now, just be patient for now, as some of these sites are still struggling with the increased loads brought on by this unexpected isolation of the population. Our site of choice, Board Game Arena, has been working hard to ramp up their capacity, and even sites like Roll20 for the uh, role-playing groups have had some initial outages in those very fir fir first days of the isolation. So tonight we are going to talk about some games that I think are great when playing when you're stuck at home uh, for a longer period than you may want to be. Like I said, this is probably like a March break or longer. So we've kind of broken this into categories where this is the type of games that I think this is your chance, right? I think about games that you don't normally, stuff that is sit on your shelf, stuff that you're like, man, that's been in my pile of shame forever. Those are the main kind of games I think now's your chance, right? Here's Here's your your chance to finally get those big games to the table, those epic games to the table, or those campaign games to the table. That was my main focus here. So now we did have someone in the chat room, Ryan, Red Meeple Ryan, who also re mentioned that solo play is another great thing to do, especially if you've got non-gamers living with you. So we're going to try to attack that on the end as well, because it's not something, that's not where my head was when I, when I was working on today's list, but it's also an excellent suggestion. So I think we're going to start off with the really long stuff. The epic games yeah. that are going to take you four or more hours, stuff where you might never consider leaving it out because of time. But, you know, if you're all home, you can eat somewhere else for a little while yeah. and keep that game set up on the table for a few days. if you need. Yeah, very true. So the, these are the big ones. These are the names that normally if I was going to play any of these games, I would schedule an event. I, I would make it an event night. I would invite people over to my house earlier in the afternoon. I would go through a rule teach. We would all sit down and have dinner together. 
then we would sit down for the long haul and play, which would probably involve one or more breaks because that's what normally happens. Now, with everyone at home, with everyone in this basically stuck together, like Sean said, you can start it in the morning, you can come back to it later, you can play, you can play for 12 hours straight without any impact, maybe, or you can break it up in four hour shifts. So the first game I got on my list is, of course, the, the grandfather of big games, the, the one most people know, and the game that everyone knows is way too long that it should be, but always fun, despite being so long, and that is Twilight Imperium. Now, I will admit, my version of Twilight Imperium, I know, is third edition, and I have played a game with eight players that was over 12 hours long. And we loved it. You just It's one of those games that, despite being a long, involved game, you don't notice it. You're so invested in the game and caught up in what's happening and planning ahead and trying to decide what technologies to make and where you're going to make your next move that you don't notice the time going by. Twilight Imperium 4th Edition, I've only tried once. And everything I've read about telling you it's shorter, streamlined, and quicker seems to be true. The game we played was excessively short, but I think that was more based on player experience than your usual expectations. But in this case, like, I think I would break out the original Twilight Imperium. Well, the original would be first opinion edition. I don't know the original. I would break out the third edition with every optional rule, with all the extra exploration cards and all the exploration tokens and the Shattered Alliance expansion and just go to it. And I would try to fit in multiple games. I'd be like, you know what? Every Monday, we're going to start a new game, a Twilight Imperium, and see how it goes and see how long during the week it takes if we play for four hours a night or whatever. Oh, so that's... Uh... Twilight Imperium, uh, third edition for the real slog, or for a little more <laughs> slightly streamlined version, there's that fourth edition. That's out now. Yes. Up next, I've got Zaya Legends of a Drift System. Now, this can be a quick game, because one of the features of Zaya Legends of a Drift System is that you can decide how many fame points to play to. And a quick game is five points. And I got to admit, a five-point game is over too quick, in my opinion. You, don't, you almost don't even get to upgrade your ship. It, it's, it's over too quickly. Like, that's not even worth playing. And a 10-point game is your usual game. But you know what? The, the score card goes to 20. And, man, that makes for a long game. I've only ever done it once, and it was overnight at an Extra Life event. And I think we went about eight hours. I don't know. I was very tired. And it was a lot of fun. And it was another one of those games where you don't notice the time passing. But you know what? There's no reason to stop at 20. Why not do a 40 fame point game of Zaya? when everyone's going to have level three ships and everyone's going to have multiple contracts and everyone's going to have multiple powers. There's no reason you can't just keep going past that point on the score track at all. And actually the same thing for Twilight Imperium. There is a long game you can play in Twilight Imperium just by adding, because it's, it's a race to 10 points, you can make it to 14. So Zaya, uh, it's, it's, we've talked about it on the show before. If you can find the Embers of a Forsaken Star expansion, it greatly improves the game, but it's not needed. Normally, I only recommend the game for three players, but you know what? When you've got the time, go for five, go for six people, each grab your own ship. When the other players are playing, you can walk away and go do something else, go do some laundry, watch Netflix for a bit, and they can call you in the room when it's your turn. That's yeah. the kind of thing, when you've got the time, there's no need to rush it, no need for everyone to be completely focused on the game. Absolutely. But again, it really is... That Embers of a Forsaken Star really does make a difference. I've, I've just heard, yeah. you know, I've experienced it myself, and I've just heard too many other people saying that once you play with it, you won't ever want to play without it. So just be aware. Again, if you don't have it, there's no reason to not to, you know, to be upset. But once you get it, you're never going to play without it. It's not going to be something you pull out of the uh, out of thing. And yeah, as Dee mentioned, probably not too many people actually have six players Trapped at home uh, with them right yeah. now. <laughs> if our entire family sat down, we'd have five. We can get my mom to play games now and then. I don't think she enjoys Zaya much, but Twilight Imperium, heck no. But <laughs> and so that was Zaya Legends of Adrift, with or without the Embers of a Forsaken Star. Oh, uh, just with. I, I don't even know if I recommend <laughs> it otherwise. No, it's not quite that bad, but it, it really is better. See if you can find a print and play version if you don't have it already. Uh, up next, Mage Knight. Now, I am not talking about the miniature skirmish game. I am talking about the uh, competitive deck-building board game. This is a deceptively heavy game, and it has a learning curve. The first scenario in the game took us about six hours to play through, and it is actually just to teach you how to play. And it's one of those where it slowly introduces you things. Like a, It reminds me of an RPG adventure. 
Because it's like you start wandering off and you put like one dungeon out on the board. And then when you land on the dungeon, it tells you how dungeons work. And then it says, okay, put out a layer and put out a wizard's tower. And then when you get to them, it'll explain how those work. So that it slowly introduces all the elements of the game. To play through the tutorial takes about six hours. Like this is one of the most epic games. It's actually a really good game with some really neat stuff going on. It is deck building. So you start off with your powers. But when you go to that dungeon and defeat the monsters, you might get more cards. You go to the wizard's tower, you can upgrade your deck. You're going to get experience points. You're going to slowly level up. It is very much a fantasy sandbox. It's, it's almost a fantasy Zaya, though the mechanics are completely different. It's more of a Euro. Uh, it's all about getting fame. And then you get into the full game and you can play it. There's multiple scenarios where like take over the towers or you can play it as a 4X game where you are literally going to discover the map as you play and every game is going to be different and it's a race to victory point. Fantastic game. The, the reason I recommend it for this is you're going to be stuck in here for a long time. You'll actually have the time and the willpower to actually learn to play because this is a big one. Like This is heavy. I like heavy games. I Us learning in 18xx was easier than trying to learn Mage Knight. Like Our first play of, of 1830 went smoother than our first play of Mage Knight. Uh, Mage Knight, I think, also has cooperative rules. And I have been told, though I haven't tried it myself, it is fantastic solo. All right, well, uh, and that, just, just to give you an idea, it's listed as a 4.55, the Ultimate Edition yeah, is, it's... on uh, on Board Game, uh, board game Geek. So yeah. it's a 4.55 weight out of 5. Yeah, that, that's beaten out uh, Food Chain Magnet and Vinhos and a whole bunch of other ones. Yeah, and as Ryan mentions, there is a deluxe edition, and that's the one Sean just looked yeah, up. The, that the it's ulti- now that Ultimate has all- Edition is, the, is what they call it, the 2018 Ultimate, uh, Mage Knight Ultimate Edition. Yeah, which I'm tempted, but again, I don't play this, right? Now is my chance. Because <laughs> normally, when am I going to break this out? I'm not going to bring this out to a local game store. When Sean's down from Hamilton, I'm not going to set up a game that takes us six hours to learn. <laughs> but that's why we're talking about these games now. Because yep. you got the time, why not get these great, they're great games. Just get them to the table. So that was Mage Knight. All right, the next one is a very shiny game, and that is Firefly the Board Game. This is another sci-fi sandbox-style game where you've got a ship, you're out in the black, do what you want, sort of. Because Firefly, you do pick a mission to play through, which is, of course, based on the TV series. I don't know if they actually had the license to the movie, so I don't know if any of the the stories are based on the movie. It's at least based on the TV series. It may also be based on the movie. I'm not certain on that. I only have the base game. Um, where you basically have your ship, you're going to go around, you're going to find a crew, and you're going to do you're going to do missions. And the neat part is it does the whole Firefly thing is some of those missions may be less than legal. So you have to watch out for the Protectorate, and of course the Reavers are flying around. It's a really neat game, but it can be ridiculously long, especially if no one focuses on completing the mission, because that's one of the things with this game is you can get distracted. You can just get distracted building your crew, trying to find the right thing and running these missions. And it's what I used to call the talisman problem, where I always find by the time people go for the crown of command and talisman, they're way overpowered. They don't need to have waited that long. And they just keep killing stuff on the outer thing to get that little extra point of strength and craft. Fireflies like that. You're just like, oh, I just if I could just get one more crew or if I could just deliver this one more thing to get this one ship upgrade. Meanwhile, if you just rush for the, the end and play the odds instead of getting there so you, like, you automatically pass all the die rolls, it can be a little quicker game. But then there's like, I don't know, 18 expansions for this thing that add more to it. And there's extra decks and there's extra planets. There's extra boards. You can get a big, uh, I think it's silkscreen mat for the whole verse. It's crazy. Huge game. Firefly fans are going to love it. This is one you may want to leave set up overnight and return to. And heck, if you're having fun with it, you could just throw out that mission and just keep playing and come up with your own victory condition. Whoever makes whatever the first 10,000 credits or something wins. And so that is Firefly the Game by uh, Gale Force 9. There are 14 expansions, and the listed playtime is two to four hours. Yeah. All right, next is one Sean, Deanna, and I play all the time on Board Game Arena. So that is an option for that one, and this is through the ages. Uh, This is by far my favorite civilization game. To me, it has everything I want in a civilization game except the map. That is the one part of this game that I feel is missing. I don't get that Sid Meier civilization feel without the map. But if I could just overlook that, this is a fantastic civ building game. Uh, one where you have to pay attention to multiple different things, trying to watch your government, trying to improve your, your basic resources while also building domestic buildings. 
and making sure you don't ignore military because wow if you ignore military and other people don't you are in for a world of hurt yeah and with uh there are also a number of different versions and so we are we are currently playing the through the ages a new story of civilization uh which is the re-implementation of the uh, through the ages a story of civilization there are also a number of role versions of the game out mm -hmm. there uh there's plenty out there but yeah so what we are playing is through the ages a new story of civilization yeah that is the only one that's currently in print too so if, if uh, you're there's a new one coming out this year though i think that's a continuation of the rolling right uh hold on let me just uh put up again here i need to uh, 2020 through the ages new leaders and wonders that sounds like an expansion uh, yes it is an expansion so yes yeah so they like said through the ages the new story of civilization is definitely the one i wonder if i'll add those into the bga version <laughs> yeah probably take them a year and a half yeah yeah so that is through the ages a new story of civilization and this year, the new expansion, Through the Ages, New Leaders and Wonders. Potentially this year. I, I would not trust a single release date yeah, at this point. True. Uh, up next, another epic game can be played two or three or four players, though designed best for two. And that has been called Lord of the Rings in the Box by many other people. That is War of the Rings. Now, I don't feel bad recommending this one, despite not having played it. I have at least read the rulebook, which is better than the last time we mentioned this game on the show. But everyone loves this game. This is the number one rated war game on Board Game Geek. It, uh, it might be number two, sorry, Twilight Struggle is still number one. It's just, it's not actually a war game. That's my own personal opinion. Uh, this one's like, again, looking like I've had people tell me it's going to take six to eight hours for your first play, just because there's a lot to learn and a lot going on. And just reading the rules, I can see it. Like, all the little miniatures mean something different. They look barely different from each other. Um, there's all these rules for when you can go to war, because it's all about when the different nations joined in the war. And you can do stuff like split up the fellowship so that when certain people go to certain areas, they can then push that forward. So if Strider goes to Gondor, or not, Str Boromir goes to Gondor, he can then make them get ready for war. But otherwise, they have to be attacked before they'll fight back. Like, it, it really takes a lot of the the story into the game which i couldn't see like it just looked like a, a version of risk to be to look at a picture of it to be honest and there's things like the elven rings and they can switch sides and the ring rays can fly anywhere on the board because they're on the i don't know what they call the things they ride if i if i still had the miniature game but anyway war of the rings i'll admit haven't played it maybe this will be a friday night stream with deanna and i sometime soon but I, I, I feel confident recommending it just by the number of other people who have told me this is an amazing game. But it's going to take a bit to learn, and it takes a long time to play. So great to play when you're stuck at home. Yeah, and that is, and it's actually, it's War of the Ring, singular, not War of the Rings, oh. plural. So War of the Ring and Second Edition is the current uh, version of that one. Yeah. Uh, it is the number four thematic game on all of Board Game Geek. With a number 12 rank overall for all games on board games. All games, yeah. Like, that's that's ridiculously high ranked. Like I said, it's supposed to be fantastic. So we're going to try it sometime soon. All as, right. As D next. points out, one ring to rule them all. Yeah. <laughs> no, because all the rings are in it. The elven rings are part of the game. So I thought it might, I don't know. This is part of the problem if I didn't finish my show notes. So I'm actually, I'm sure you can tell because I'm saying way too much about each game. I'm improving all this, so I didn't get to double check the names of the games. <laughs> all right, last one for the epic game list, and that is Dominant Species. And I think I'm only putting this on the list because I really want to play it while we're in quarantine because I haven't played that in too long. Uh, this is a game where you are going to take a species and evolve it from their base state, spreading out, adapting to different types of terrain and adapting what they can eat and living through ice ages and playing through a species evolving from say back i think you're, you're literally supposed to be playing on pangea when it starts and the game is timed by the fact the ice age is coming and the various land terrain and the environs in the game start shrinking as it all turns into ice so dealing with a shrinking amount of resources while trying to evolve your species uh this is a one of the best worker placement games i've ever played which combines worker placement with action selection where there are a bunch of different options for your species like you can you can speciate which is to propagate you can evolve you can move you can spread your territory a fantastic heavy euro game 
from uh, GMT Games, who usually make war games. I got to admit, it's kind of butt ugly because, like, instead of your species, you have little cubes and cones. And, and, like, for what it is. And, yes, there's companies out there that replace all those with neat pieces. But, man, is it a really solid game. But, again, you're looking at three to four hours minimum to play. Last time we played at my friend Jamie's house, who introduced the game to me, it was over five hours. And we had to call it because it just it got too late at night. We, you know, we started at 8 o'clock. We're like, it's 2 in the morning. We can tell your brother's going to win. Let's just call it. Yeah, it's uh, it's listed as a 2 to 4 hour play. It's a 4.0 weight. Uh, now, it has been it has uh, been re-implemented by two different versions. There's the card game, which oh, doesn't rate well. But there's terrible. also Dominant Species Marine, which is much which is higher rated, although not as well rated. Yeah, the, the card game is, I, I would say, I, I don't want to say too many. Not to my taste at all. It, I, well, I it's not to a lot of people's taste, judging yeah, by, I, judging I, by I, game it's, it's one of the games. I will not play that. I, I pulled my copy and warned the person who bought it. <laughs> like, like I, it, it's one I might have donated like to, to a library or something, right. but then other people might find it. I, I did not enjoy that game at all. Like, and Dominant Species is so good. I think that's part of it. Maybe if it didn't have Dominant Species on the box, I might have enjoyed it. But no, I, I that game was not to my liking at all um the other one i don't know so that the the water one marine yeah marine that i don't know at all so again that was dominant species uh 2010 game from gmt game and now we're going to move on to rather than those games that on their own take forever the <laughs> legacy yeah. games where you stretch out multiple sessions but there's no reason you can't do those back to back very true. And actually, my first game on the list fits that very well because the first few games, we did play them back to back. So the good thing about legacy games, so legacy games are one and done, right? 99% of them, despite the fact they may say otherwise, you're going to play these games once. And once you're done with them, they're done. And they usually require uh, 10 to 15 plays. There are exceptions, obviously. And what better time to play a game where you're going to get in 10 to 15 games in a row to get the full experience than when you're stuck at home for an extended period of time. Like, this is your chance to play through a legacy game from start to finish and get the entire experience. And the rewarding part about that is you don't have that downtime between games where you forget the rules, you forget what's happening, or you forget even just the impact of what happened in the last game. Like, if you're playing, well, you know, it's my first recommendation would be Rick Risk Legacy. There is something that happens when you use three nukes in one fight. That is a huge change to the game. If that happens, and then you don't play the game till six months later, you're just like, oh, what are those new rules for that new thing? You just don't have that impact. Whereas if you sit down and play it again, right away, you're like, oh, now the new thing's happening, and we get to experience it. So yeah, my first game on the list is Risk Legacy. And literally, for the first few games at least, you can play two to three games in a regular game night. This is Risk that you can finish in about 15 to 30 minutes for the first couple games. Because they did some really smart changes to the game. For one, it's based on victory points. First person to four victory points wins. So it's not about taking over the whole map. And then at the beginning of the game, everyone gets a victory point for free. Because anyone who hasn't won a game yet gets a victory point. Plus, you get a victory point for controlling your own base. And well, everyone gets a base. So your first game of Risk Legacy, you start with two points. You're halfway there the first game. Now, once you start beating other people, you lose those points, and then a whole bunch of stuff changes, and this was the first Legacy game. And it's still fantastic. Like, I was blown away. I do not enjoy Risk. I'll play it. I'll play it begrudgingly. I hate the end condition. There's a modern version of Risk where it actually adds missions in and ways to get points and makes it a point-based game that's better. But Risk Legacy is good enough that I am considering buying a second copy to play it with another group. The other thing with Risk Legacy, whether you may or may not want to do this, when you finish, you can keep playing. So you play through, I can't remember what it is, I think it's 12 games. Once you're done your 12 games, you now have a unique Risk board that you can play Risk on for the rest of your life that's different from anyone else in the world. Which I actually think is a really neat thing, but we never got that far. And I admit, most people I know mounted theirs on the wall and don't play anymore, but I do like that that's an option, unlike other Legacy games. Some other Legacy games. And this is one of the few games you'll find on our recommendations from Hasbro. <laughs> yep, that's true. Hasbro does own Wizards of the Coast and Avalon Hill, so yeah. it it's how they choose to yeah. brand their games is what it is. 
But that, yeah, so this was Risk Legacy from 2011. All right, next is the, the big boy, the biggest box behind me over here. That is Gloomhaven. Uh, we talk about Gloomhaven almost every week. We live stream Gloomhaven. Uh, this is a fantastic game, one to four players. Again, here's a good solo game. If you're by yourself, I realize it's a lot of money. It is. But for the amount of gameplay you're getting out of this, we have been playing our Gloomhaven campaign since September 2018. It does not feel like we are even close to finishing this. Now, we do play irregularly once a week. And we definitely haven't played once a week. And I'm terrible at logging my plays, so I can't even tell you how many times we played or how many scenarios we've beaten. But I've been told it's on average about 100 plays if you win every one. And you're not going to win every one because Gloomhaven is a much heavier game than most people think. This is not Hero Quest. This is not Descent. This is a very much a resource management, hand management game. It's a big cooperative puzzle, to be honest. It's a puzzle about how to how to how to solve each of the scenarios, which are all very different. It's not just beat up the bad guy. This is one that I strongly recommend, just because again, you're going to get to play multiple times close together. You're going to remember what happened. You're going to get to know your characters, and you're going to get to see the story evolve without those gaps in between. So you don't have problems like our group gets together and go, "What were we doing? Where are we going next?" And we have no clue, and we've had to start taking notes because we forget where our various story paths are. That's we need to you know we we've luckily got guys in the chair to help and yes. uh, you know we can always check replays every once in a while to uh, to double check I, I think yep. we've only ever we've actually had to go back and check the replay once for sure but uh, it has been done yes it has and so that is of course Gloomhaven uh, a little pricey but well worth the money especially and that plays you know anywhere from one to four players and right now you know. It's it's the kind of game where, especially when you don't know how long you've got, uh, it's the kind of game that's uh, just great to go into. It's unlikely you're going to finish Gloomhaven before the quarantine ends, but who knows? All right, up next, I got three games. I'm going to go through a little quicker because I haven't played them. Again, uh, now and then, if, if I hear games where people talk about them all the time, so anytime I talk about best legacy games, stuff like that, people mention these. I want to throw them on the list just so I'm trying to cover all my bases. So the first is Betrayal Legacy. I know Danielle in our chat is a huge fan of this. People seem to really be enjoying this. I am really not a fan of Betrayal at House of the Hill, and I have heard this is way better than all of the versions of Betrayal at House of the Hill out so far. It rates better. I've seen it on Board Game Geek. The, the reviews seem to be good. I've had some really nasty experiences with the original. I'm willing to try this. It's just not one I own yet. So uh, this is Betrayal House of the Hill, which I, I don't even know how to describe that game. It's so unique. It's a group of people go into a house, and while you're exploring the house, something happens, and what happens is randomly generated in the original game. And that could be there's a murderer in the house, or the house suddenly catches on fire, or something, the, 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 the ghosts show up, or something happens. And in the main game, one of the players then has to like read the, leave the room, read the rule book, and then the game changes. And then the other players read their book, and they have their own goals. It's a really unique system that just doesn't always work, whereas Legacy seems to have fixed that. Um, strong recommendation from everyone out there. That is Betrayal Legacy. All right, next one is from Stonemeyer Games, and that is Charterstone. Uh, I am a huge fan of Above and Below. And this is supposedly like that, where you are doing an evolving story, where you are expanding your civilization and spreading out into the world and spreading your civilization, adding stickers to the map, playing for a full legacy game. Of all the ones we're talking about tonight, this is one I know the least about. So I'm just going to stop here and say a lot of people strongly recommend Star Charterstone as one of the better legacy games out there. It's also one where you can get removable stickers so you can resell your copy or reuse it after you played through. Absolutely, it's uh, it's rated a seven five overall yeah. on uh, Board Game Geek, and that's with almost ten thousand ratings. So that's a pretty yeah. solid uh, number to go off of. And that is Charter Stone from twenty seventeen, coming from Stonemeyer Games, designer Jamie Stegmeyer. All right, the last Legacy game I've got on my list for tonight is Aeon's End Legacy. Now, Aeon's End is a cooperative deck-building game where you're playing these, like, sorcerers who are trying to hold back evil horrors at bay and protect your... your oh, I forgot one. I'm gonna Sorry, there's going to be one more Legacy game after this. 
um, and trying to protect your stronghold or your, your home base. Uh, the really neat part in this game is it is, for one, it's a cooperative deck builder, which you don't see uh, that often. And second is you never shuffle your deck. So it is all about stacking your deck. So when you discard, the order your cards go in, you are just going to flip that deck over next turn, which is a huge part of this game. Aeon's End and Legacy takes that game, takes it to the Legacy Extreme, where what you do in Scenario 1 is going to matter for Scenario 2. You're going to add cards to your deck, rip up cards, and all the fun Legacy stuff. This is one I really want to try. Again, strongly recommended by other people. Haven't had a chance to play it myself, but recommended by enough people. I feel solid in recommending it myself. And this one also plays well as solo. Oh, We've got good one to know. Four-player. It's been listed as best at two, but uh, it does have a solid number of ratings as a solo game. And so, next, last, last one on the uh, Legacy Games list. Uh, that would be Clank Legacy Acquisitions Incorporated. I love Clank, and I gotta admit, I skipped over this game because I know nothing about Acquisitions Incorporated. Or to be honest, I didn't know anything about it. Since then, I've looked into it since the D&D book came out. I had no clue it's a Penny Arcade thing and it's their home D&D campaign. Well, they added that to Clank, and I thought it was going to change Clank, but no, it's still Clank. It's just using the names and the, and the characters and the places from Acquisitions Incorporated, and no way is knowledge of Acquisitions Incorporated required. You're still doing the same Clank thing. You're running in. You're trying to grab the treasure. You're trying to get out before the dragon bakes you, but you're also exploring a world and putting on stickers and adding cards to the deck and things like that. It sounds fantastic. I love Clank, and I actually am kind of kicking myself for avoiding this one. I probably shouldn't have. The Acquisitions Incorporated uh, theme on this doesn't change it from the base Clank. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this I, I've I'm, I've really been interested in the Acquisitions Incorporated concept. Uh, it sounds like a really fun way to uh, to sort of change up not only Clank but you know D and D as well. And uh, it's got some uh, powerful ratings. It's an eight nine eight point nine. Wow. On, uh, on board That's game huge. Right now. Uh, that is ridiculous. Overall, it's 350, you know, 357 overall on BGA. Oh, I'm and surprised it's, it's not higher with that rating. And it's only, uh, I mean, it's only been out for a year. So <laughs> that one's probably going to keep going up. Yeah. So that was Clank Legacy Acquisitions Incorporated. And that was the end of our legacy games for those people who want to sort of play something that evolves and changes with your plays. Now, next up, we have something that you, that where you're still playing for a long period of time in multiple sessions, but instead of necessarily changing things, you're just going on an adventure, sometimes with development, sometimes not. The campaign yeah, so, games. Yeah, we've got campaign games and scenario-based games. I've, I've grouped them together. Uh, we do have an entire episode about campaign games. I don't have time to grab the episode number. But check that out. See what I mean by the difference between a campaign game and a scenario-based game. I do think they're completely different. This list is going to have both. And the reason I'm recommending these games are, of course, because now is your chance to play through a full campaign of these games. Now is your chance to, to start from the beginning and get to the end or possibly play through multiple campaigns or try different branching paths. Um, we've got quite a few on this list. And we'll go through those, starting with um, something I thankfully got to review this year that I would have totally overlooked otherwise, and that is Cthulhu Death May Die. This is a big... Uh, is it Cool Mini or not? Yep. That's the yeah, cool mini, yeah, big Cool Mini or not miniature-based Cthulhu game that is so different from every other Cthulhu game out there, in my opinion. It's not about investigation, slowly going insane and trying to solve the mystery. It's about breaking down the door losing your mind, punching Cthulhu in the face, and shooting sub Niggeroth with your shotgun. Very different style of game. I've had way more fun than this game than I ever expected to. The base box comes through five missions? It's five or six scenarios in the base box, but it also comes with two different Elder Gods, so you can try each scenario with each Elder God. Now, what I did find lacking in this game is there's no carryover. You could literally just play scenario five, or you could play scenario one, you don't have to play them in order, order and there's no ongoing story, but it gives you an awful lot of replayability in one box. And again, great to play when you're stuck at home for a long period of time. You'll get to try every scenario with every god over time. Yeah, absolutely. And I, this one is such a fun game, uh, and it does take a little bit of setup, so it's something that, you know, is nice to be able to have that time. And again, like some of the other games, if you've got something you can leave a little bit set up or, or out on the table, 
uh, there's a, a good bit of putting away and miniatures and things to it. So again, yeah. of course, being a Simon game. So now now is the time where if you can uh, dedicate some table space to it for a while, you just get a bunch of plays in. You're not going to be as bothered by the whole putting away and taking out mm-hmm. uh, again. All right, up next, a game we recommend far too often, but it's really good. That's Star Wars Imperial Assault. One player plays, well, it depends how you play. With the base game, one player plays the Empire, the other players play a group of heroes, plays up to five people, and you play through a 10-mission campaign with branching paths that is ridiculously replayable, especially if you add in expansions, because the resources to the Empire player are randomized, which side quests come up are randomized. Each character has their own side quest that's added into the deck. There are a ridiculous number of expansions for this game. And even better, if you don't like that whole one versus many thing, there's now an app that turns into a pure co-op game. If you get bored playing through the campaign, it also includes a skirmish mode, which is basically a really solid two-player miniature battle game. You're getting all that in one box. Like this is, We're going to recommend this game for the next 10 years, I think, at this point. It's going to come up every two to three shows because it just it covers so many areas. This is your chance to sit down and play a campaign from game one to game ten. And then maybe swap it up so someone else gets to play the dark side and go through it all again. There you go. That is Imperial Assault. All right. The Imperial Assault is part of a series of games with dungeon crawl games from Fantasy Flight, the latest of which is Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle Earth. This one is pure co-op that requires an app, so you don't have any... Uh, you know, Dark Forces player in this one. It jumps right to the app. It's basically Fantasy Flight, took everything they learned from Imperial Assault, improved on it, threw on a Lord of the Rings theme on top of it. Uh, Personally, I think go with whichever you think is cooler. If you're into fantasy, pick up Journeys of Middle-Earth. If you're into sci-fi, pick up Imperial Assault. Or if you're like me and like both, just buy both games. Again, that's Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle-Earth. All right, next, I've got Mechs versus Minions, which is the other huge box behind me. This is one that a lot, not a lot of people have heard of. It is the most well-produced board game I've ever seen in my life. It's put out by the League of Legends people. The only way to actually buy it, well, technically you can buy it on Amazon. Don't do that. Go to the League of Legends site, and you can buy the game direct from them. For the cost, I've never seen a game with so much bits and so much production value for that cost. This is almost a legacy game because you unlock stuff and you rip open packages. But you don't make any permanent changes. You just rip open envelopes, and every envelope adds new elements to the game. It's a programmed movement game that's slightly different, and i got to say more fun than Robo Rally. Now, I like Robo Rally for the strategy and thinking and not like the... It's it's a different type of fun, where this is more random, run around, do silly things fun, whereas Robo Rally is more try to plan out your moves kind of fun. I think this one's more accessible. Um, Program is a lot simpler. And it's cooperative, which is also a very big change from other programmed games. You are working together to fight against the minions in your mech. Uh, we have never finished a campaign of this one. This is one that, again, we had a player who was part of the group that's no longer part of the group, so we never finished. Plus, Deanna, I got to admit, didn't like it, but she's not a fan of co-op games in the first place or program movement games. So that was two strikes before we started. But again, you're stuck in your home for a long period of time. Now is your chance to pick it up and play through the entire campaign and get to see all the cool unlocks that happen as you play through. Yeah. So again, this is Mechs versus Minions from Riot Games. If you want to buy this from Riot Games at the League yes. of Legends site, it is uh, a mid-weight game. It sits right in there, just under the 2.5 rate. It's best of four players, uh, and each game should take you between an hour, an hour and a half per per session. If you're yeah, it sounds uh, about right. One off, uh, and again. This is a really well-rated game. I mean, there's, it's not well-known, but it is really well-regarded by everyone who has played it. And every time I see it mentioned on Twitter, it's someone else going, oh, my God, this game is amazing. How, I, I can't How believe they it put only... this out for 75 yeah. bucks? Exactly. Like, 75 so, bucks isn't cheap, but, man, you got to see this game. Like, yeah, I mean, like you're it easily is... looking at $100 plus worth of game for oh, yeah. 75 bucks. Uh, if, this, if this was a cool mini game, you're looking like 150 to 200 easily. So that was Mechs versus Minions, Riot Games. All right, next I've got Arcadia Quest. This is another uh, cool mini or not. we got a lot of cool mini or not campaign games. This is a PvP campaign game, though, where each player is going to take a war band of fantasy characters and compete to win through campaign fights. And after you fight one scenario, 
it unlocks other scenarios, and there is carryover in this game, which is something I like. Now, it's not much. It's one of those, if you are the one, the winner, you get a little sigil, and then when you go to the next thing, you get a little bonus. But at least there's some carryover. Um, you can't just, you have to play them in order. Um, it's tiered where you play so many battles on the outside tier, and it shows you're actually raiding a castle. And then you do so many battles in the inside tier, and then there's a big final battle. Uh, Tom Vassal liked to call this game, like to say it felt like Looney Tunes. Because it was just so back and forth, where it's like, oh, I'm winning, no, you're winning, and oh, I hit you with my arrows, oh, I pushed you back. And he, he, to him, it felt like Looney Tunes. I, I'll admit I didn't really get that out of it, but it is a really neat game. And I gotta admit, I love the miniatures, and I thought I would hate them because they are a very distinct chibi, chibi anime style that I think worked really great for fantasy figures. Like, you're looking at goblins and orcs and trolls and elves and dwarves with the, their heads as big as their bodies, and I, I should hate it, but I love it in Arcadia Quest. I love the way the miniatures look in this game. Plus, they come pre-assembled, which is awesome compared to other games like that, like, say, Super Dungeon Explorer. Now, that was Arcadia Quest, but now I noticed that last year they came out with Starcadia Quest. Yes. Is this just the uh, the sci-fi retheme? As far as I know. I the, one of the, Again, the problem with playing Arcadia Quest is you have to play five or six missions in a row with the same group, and it's almost like they intend you to play all the same night. Like, there is a little tracking sheet, but it's not good enough to track all the things, like all the things you have for your group. Right. And I think it's really set up to play, like, a 12-hour session from beginning to end, at like, on a tournament or something, and I just never did that. So, because of the fact I never, ever finished a campaign of Arcadia Quest, I admit I ignored Starcadia Quest. Right. And I, I also there is have the... Some other aspects you can integrate into Arcadia Quest. They talk about... Uh, uh, I've never actually noticed an integrate with before uh but arcadia quest inferno masmora dungeons of arcadia and masmora dungeons of arcadia kickstarter integrates with yeah arcadia so there, there's also like i have the forgotten kings which that's a whole new campaign but then the dungeons let you while you're playing the campaign also go into the dungeons kind of like the expansions for talisman so the games are not at all similar but the kind of thing where you can go into the dungeons of arcadia and there's arcadia quest pets so you can have like your pokemon basically yeah. with you like there's a lot to it i just own i own the base game and i own the forgotten king expansion because i really like the look of the necromancer chibi figure was was the main thing all right well that was arcadia quest all right this is another one i own it i've read the rules uh i can say they're good rules they're they're overly complicated rules that try to cover every possible little situation and that is because it is a pathfinder game and that is pathfinder otherwise known as math finder by some people the Adventure Card Game. This is another deck-building game where you have a deck for your character. You are going to go on uh, what they call Adventure Pass, like RPG-like scenarios that all involve you searching through location decks to try to find quest, like the, the next step in the quest and eventually defeat some boss. Um, as you improve, you're going to add more cards to your deck. You're going to check off. You get feats as you evolve. This is as close as you're going to get to a role-playing game in card game format. This is one I think Sean and I would have loved back in the day. And again, though it doesn't require the same group, when you're playing through a story that tells a complete story, you kind of want the same people with you every time. So you all get to experience the same story together. And it is not a game where you can drop in and out unless someone dies. Someone can die and someone can make a new character, but there's no way to, like, Sean comes down for the weekend, here, come play Pathfinder with us. It just doesn't work. So this is why I'm recommending for this for when you're stuck at home for a long period of time, you can play through a whole adventure path. And there are plenty of adventure paths if you manage to get through the first one. All right. Well, that is Pathfinder Adventure Card Game. All right. Next is Legends of Andor, which is a game that totally deceived me because when I saw it, I thought it was another dungeon crawl game. It's got all these fantasy people, and I thought it was going to be a roll the dice and battle and fight the monsters, where in fact it is a giant puzzle. It's a giant cooperative puzzle using a medieval map where you start with a castle in the middle and something is happening in the lands, which the first couple missions are monsters are raiding it. And the interesting part is the fact that it's all about only having so much time and each of your actions takes so much time before it's nighttime and trying to figure out the action economy and who should do what. And the main thing that made it feel like a puzzle to me was the fact that you have to take into account things like, well, we lose if five monsters go to the castle, so we're going to let four of them get there. And it was all about solving the scenario much more so than rushing out, fighting, and rolling the dice. It was it was pretty much the opposite of Cthulhu Death May Die. This, this is a really neat cooperative puzzle game 
the, the, like it's, it's from Cosmos, and like it most reminds me of the Exit games in a way, like just the way your brain has to think. Um, I, I, it's a, it's a great fantasy co-op. Just don't expect a, a dungeon crawl on Arcadia Quest, a Cthulhu Death May Die. Right. So that's Legends of Andor, and possibly sometime this year we may see Legend uh, Andor Junior, which is oh, that's a more family version of Legends of Andor. And there are actually three chapters to Legends of Andor, and there are multiple expansions. I just have the base box. Uh, my last one is any of the Command & Color games. So we're looking at Memoir 44, Command & Color Ancients, Command & Color Napoleonics, Command & Color Medieval, any of those games, because all of them feature scenarios. So these are miniature, uh, miniatures, are about a term. War games, uh, some use blocks, some use miniatures, that it's a card-driven war game. It is my favorite war games out there. I am not a Hex Encounter fan, but I love Command and Colors, where you are using a big hex board, you're using cards to determine where you're going to attack and which units you're going to move. All scenario-driven. You don't have to play them in order, but if you play them in order, it tells usually a historic story. Uh, there is also Battle Lore, which is a non-historic version where there are no campaigns. So that's the, re the reason I didn't mention Battle Lore before, is each game's its own individual game. Whereas the original Command and Colors games, you're going to play through the Siege of Rome, or you're going to play Carthage attacking uh, the Siege of Rome, or you're going to play through the Hundred Years' War, or you're going to play through a Napoleonic battle, or you're going to play the the landing on D-Day, and then you're going to play through the various battles through throughout. Again, I recommend this one strongly just because you can play that full campaign. You can get that full experience. It's not just a one-off where you're like, eh, let's pick this third scenario and play it. All right, well... Moving on from campaign games, a lot of those are, you know, 14 plus games necessarily. So now yeah. we've got some suggestions where you've got games for the whole family, games where you can uh, bring in your kids, uh, you know, as long as they're able to sit at the table for a little while and, and concentrate and focus, Yeah, we can bring them in on these games. Yeah, so if you're if you're stuck home with kids, uh, we're stuck home with kids. If you've got kids at the table, there's no reason not to play some games with them at the same time. Now, this is sticking to the same theme of epic games or longer, not necessarily longer games, but games with multiple plays. So games that are going to take you a while to get to the end of. So games that, that are worth sitting down over multiple nights to play through. And we're going to start with one of Sean's favorites that he's further than we are in the campaign, and that is Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. Uh, this is a was it two to four player or one to four player? Uh, two to four. You could, you could one more. You could, you could, you could one player it, but you'd be okay. doing the man, you know, multiple hand managing, and I would. Yeah, yeah, that's not so great. So, so two to four player cooperative card game set in the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Uh, it's almost a legacy game because you're unlocking bo books boxes which represent the books. After you beat book one, you open up the box for book two, which introduces new rules. Once you finish the main game, there's also now two expansions out. To continue the story. Has the second one dropped yet? I don't know. I think it is. But yeah. I, I saw it for sale, but it might have been a pre-order. Right. But yeah, no, and this is uh and this is not an easy game. It's a family game, but it's not a let's all be happy and beat it. You're good yeah. you, know, you will struggle, especially, you know, with kids uh who aren't, you know, expert game players. There is there is uh, a real difficulty to it. Um, but it's fun because I and I think personally I think it's more fun because there's a chance to lose. You know, you're not walking through it. The kids get a little disappointed, but there's nothing wrong with learning learning about disappointment in games. <laughs> um, and uh, it's really enjoyable to think about what you've uh, you've done and not done. That is, uh, again, Harry Potter, Hogwarts Battle, and there's a lot of replayability, even if you don't have the expansions. Uh, you know, once you finish that deck, you can just go back and fight the Dark Lord once again. Yeah, you can just keep replaying it with just the base set. And the other thing, too, is suggestion, just if you are playing with younger kids, is play with open hands. That way you can help coach them on what cards to play. They generally, I mean, we generally recommend that anyway. I think game, the game plays that way sort of naturally. Yeah. So. All right, up next, I've got Mice and Mystics. This is a classic plaid hat game that tells the story of a prince cursed to turn into a mouse and his retinue. And you are playing small mice being chased by rats trying to reclaim your kingdom. One of the, the coolest themes, in my opinion, some amazing looking miniatures. The only caveat with this game is this is a little heavy. This one's for older kids, uh, younger, uh, at like grade school for sure, later grade school to teens. Uh, but this is also one adults could also enjoy. It's more the theme that's child friendly. 
than the actual game and the mechanics. This is one where the parents are probably going to help out. It is basically a dungeon crawl. It's an Imperial Assault. It's a Lord of the Rings journeys in Middle Earth with, you know, all that goes with it, with rules for line of sight and rules for range attacks and close-up attacks. But this is cooperative, which is perfect for that. And uh, there are any kids. number of expansions available for it as well. Uh, now, they say, community says a, uh, ages 8 and up. Uh, I would find that a little rough. Like, uh, we started too early for this game, and I've now shelved it to bring back out. I'm now at the point with my kids being 13 and 10, 12 and 10. <laughs> I could do the math some other time. 12 and 10 at this point. Yeah, 12 and 10 at this point. That that I think they're possibly, probably ready now to, to give it another shot. Yeah, it is a midweight game. It's a 2.6. So Yeah, that's that's up. That's above Race for the Galaxy. Yep. Right? So I, I wouldn't want to try to teach my kids Race for the Galaxy at this point. And that was Mice and Mystic. All right, up next, this is another game from Plaid Hat, which is their evolution. And this is what I recommend for younger kids, and that is Stuffed Fables. If I thought the theme from Mice and Mystics was cool, this blows it away. You are the toys protecting a girl who's spending her first night in the big bed from the monsters under her bed. It is a what they call a storybook game, where you're going to fold out the book. It's a spiral book, and on one side is going to be your map to play on, and on the other side is the rules for that scenario. Extremely well done, varied tales, uses a neat dice pool system. This one definitely ages eight plus. I probably could have started younger with my kids. And I actually recommend this one over Mice and Mystics if you have younger kids. All right, and that was Stuffed Fables. All right, next I got Talisman Legendary Tales. We're going to be talking a lot more about that in our review segment. But this is a five scenario campaign, very loosely based on the original Talisman universe with some tie-ins to that. It is a cooperative bag builder for the entire family. So uh, just remember that this is not Talisman. This is Talisman yeah. Legendary Tales. This is not your father's Talisman. Uh, and so that was, that was uh, our selection for the, the family games. For those of you who've got uh, you know some younger kids, not young, but younger. Mm -hmm. Uh, and next up, we've got some games that I think we've talked about a lot. Most people who listen to this show are going to be pretty familiar with, but are yeah. still really good because you can play them over and over again. Yeah, so this is going to be very subjective compared to the other stuff. Not that any reviewer or, 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 cons or any recommendations we say aren't subjective, but these to me are more subjective than the rest. These are games I personally never get sick of playing. So this is the, these are games that I think have extremely high replayability. And we're going to be a little short on the description of most of these because these are games we've talked about before. So I'm going to group a couple together to start, which is Azul and Sagrada. These are both engine building games where you are drafting things and putting them onto your personal player boards in order to score points. Abstract games that have almost universal appeal. I've yet to find someone that totally hates either of these games. They're nice quick play time, but they're strategic and deep enough that like I'm still learning things in Azul, how I could be playing better. And then Sagrado with its various tools and the different windows is so different every time you play it. That's what really ups the replayability on that one. Absolutely. And I think with Azul, I think we, we're including all three versions in this one. Yes. Uh, now, our favorite right now is the Summer Pavilion. Yeah. Uh, while Azul, the original, still is a fantastic game. Now, I think that Stained Glass of Sintra is a game where when you've got more time, I'm actually sure. more interested in playing that. You know, if, uh, if I am stuck at home, I'd yeah. be more willing to put Stained Glass of Tintra out there to really delve into it and learn some fair. of the ins and outs. Yeah, fair. It's a, it's a game that would take some time to master, and this now is your chance to get that mastery. Yep. I agree. Uh, up next, one of my favorite card games of all time, Race for the Galaxy. If you haven't played it before, having lots of time might be good for learning all those icons. Uh, despite that, it's still one of my favorite games of all time. It is one of the best two-player games ever made, in my opinion. Um, I personally think you need to have the Gathering Storm expansion to really make the game, but the base game on its own works. Uh, 4X, done with cards. Uh, plays like up to seven players. I doubt you have that many people stuck in your house, but if you do, it's one of the few games it does, but that's only with the expansion. Base game plays five. Every expansion adds another player. Uh, they say uh, two, to, two to four is uh, base game. The base game? Oh, sorry. I guess the base game is four. See, I'm saying add Gathering Storm, then it plays five. Let's <laughs> Gathering Storm just rebalances the deck a lot better, and it adds it adds some rules that I found were missing from the original game. It gives you something to aim for. It gives you those goals at the beginning of the game. Uh, this is another one you can play for free on Board Game Arena, which we do constantly. I currently have three games going. 
I haven't had a, a Race to the Galaxy game going in ages. Oh, well, we got lots going. I don't even know who's in them anymore. So. <laughs> uh, I, I and I do the roll for the Galaxy, another one, which is another one. Yeah, that's high replayability, you know, over and over again. Yeah, roll's another good recommendation. I just prefer race, but yeah, roll could be on this list. Uh, I think honestly, for for playing at home, I think I would rather play race. There's something about playing a card game when you're sitting around, sitting yeah. around the house. But uh, that was race for the Galaxy. All right, next, Carcassonne. I think everyone knows this tile laying game. I don't know why I don't get sick of this game. I haven't played this game since, like, it came out in the year 2000 or so. So I've had, like, 20 years of playing Carcassonne, and I'm still not sick of it. You'll note I don't have Catan on this list, but I do have Carcassonne. And one thing to say about Carcassonne, the digital version is phenomenal. So yes. even if you don't have Board Game Arena, if you can pick up the Asmodee digital version, you can play with people no matter where they are, even if you're all stuck at yeah. different homes. It is a fantastic fantastic implementation of the game though in that case everyone does need to own it that's true that that is the one disadvantage of the asmodee digital version on steam speaking of steam if you want something heavier that has like has people hooked steam is a pick up and deliver train game or rail game uh there's steam and age of steam they're basically the same game steam is slightly simplified this is one of the best heavy games that's ever come out in my opinion um, I, I love this game for what it is. There is the base rules, there's the expansion rules that add some, or not the expansion, the, the advanced rules that add an auction mechanic. You're looking at it, if you want a heavier economic game and you're not into 18xx, that's the next step. Steam is that step below an 18xx. If you even run out of maps, you can go online and print and play maps for Steam. There have got to be a hundred different maps for Steam out there, including officially published ones and non-published ones. The maps for Age of Steam are compatible with Steam, so whichever version you prefer. I personally own Steam. Love it. Um, the base game, you can finish a game in two hours. But then, depending on what maps you play with, you can make it a lot longer. It is a game that I honestly think is infinitely replayable if you like train games. If you like that style of game, there's always something more. And, like, I don't even get sick of playing on the base map, which the base game comes with two maps, two-sided. And so that was Steam or Age of Steam from Mayfair Games not the online digital store. Yes, not the store. Uh, next, Terra Mystica. The main reason I am throwing this on the list is because of the number of factions in that game. I don't even remember how many is it. Is it 13 or 12 or whatever yeah, it is? I think it's 13. There are a ridiculous number of factions. So here's your chance to try every faction in Terra Mystica and figure out which is your favorite. Also, I love the game. I am a big fan of the game. The replayability and the asymmetry in the replayability of this game really makes it uh, a game that's, that's great to go back to time and time again. Even if it's the only game you've got in your house, you can still yep. get a lot of play before you're tired of it. And man, the more you play, the, the tighter every game is going to get as people start to master the various rules. That was Terra Mystica. All right, next is Tales of the Arabian Nights. This is a very unique game. You have a big map and you're like the Age of Sinbad and you are going to wander around the map and encounter people, and using a Which Way book, things are going to happen. That's about the best way I can describe it. You're going to have this weird, epic adventure where you met people and got robbed by beggars and then went on a ship and went out to an island and fought a kraken and then turned into a woman and then returned home and got married. Like, it's, it's a really big, epic game that takes a long time to play because the end game scoring is terrible. So you just throw it out, decide you're going to play Tales for the Arabian Nights for six hours, then everyone's going to have this weird, epic experience and story that you'll be able to talk about for the weeks to come. That is Tales of the Arabian Nights from Zedvan Games. All right, next is Terraforming Mars. It is my most played game of 2019. I don't know how. I don't get sick of this game. I, I love Terraforming Mars. It's probably my number one game. I should probably stop saying it's Shogun because I played way more Terraforming Mars than I've ever played Wallenstein or Shogun. I, there's something about that game that just keeps... It, I, it's always interesting. Um, make sure, since you've got the time, use the drafting variant, because it does improve the game strategically and tactically, removes some of the random elements of the game. And this is another one where there is a great digital version. I've already seen people uh, on uh, on Twitter and, and board game Twitter calling out, hey, we've got two people playing. We, we, we could use a third person to play yep. Terraforming Mars on Steam. Uh, you know, it's it's a, it's not a quick game, so it's no. not something I would recommend doing while you're working from home. But after yes. work, 
go ahead and jump in and uh, and and that uh, and it also has the solo version built in so yeah. if you want to work on your terraforming mars skills that solo game is really hard it's not something you're going to win first time or 12th time i think i've tried <laughs> i'm not very good at the solo game <laughs> yeah and actually the, the board game itself does play well solo as well yeah. so that is a solo recommendation we'll throw out there uh, next is basically Magic the Gathering. I put down, but any CTG, because all of those deck building games are all about learning your deck, learning your opponent's deck, and slowly tweaking until you can beat each other. And I think when you've got an extended period of time, back when I was into Magic, I'll admit, I don't play it now. We could play game after game after game. When we were at the University of Windsor, I would play six to 20 games of Magic in one day. Like, we'd sit down and play this person, then play this person, then i tweak my deck, and i put one new card in, i put another new, oh, I, this didn't quite work, I need a different mana balance, and we just kept playing. Yeah. So I think it's a great game, as long as you have access to get the cards, but you could be playing online, plus lots of people do it, just print and play. Like, there are magic card generators out there, use proxies, you don't necessarily have to go out and buy all the cards to play these games. So Magic the Gathering, but also any of them, like, if you want to dive into Android Netrunner, Here's a great chance to try an asymmetric game. Or if you're into Feudal Japan, you could pick up the Legend of the Five Rings living card game. There are a ton of these out here. And especially if there's only two of you, it's a great dueling game. Any of these deck building dueling games, Sorcerer even for White Wizard games, now's your chance to figure out your favorite combo of lineage, Sorcerer, and Domain. Uh, and the other thing I would, I would add on to this, as again, I'm going to go with the digital version, is Ascension. Uh, again, I don't, I'm I'm not a fan of Ascension as a, a card game unless you're just playing with the base or maybe the first expansion yeah. uh, because it gets unwieldy. But the digital version is fantastic. And not only can you do uh, online play, solo play, but you can do pass and play as well, I believe, correct? Yes. Yep. So with, at least on the phone app. Yeah. yeah so so if you've it. got the you know, if you've got the you know, iPad or something, you got you can sit around at home and, and play it just that way. Uh, I've just recently gotten back into it and realized I'd forgotten most of the cards and I'm sure yeah, I, I started right. again back at the, uh, at the beginning, uh, just playing online or offline to, uh, to re reintroduce myself to the game. Cause it's just been a long time. And I'm so now we could probably go on for another hour with great games to play when you're stuck at home. But instead, what I'm going to recommend is check out some of our previous podcast episodes, like our game recommendations. We've got all kinds out there. Like, in particular, one of the topics we've covered quite a few times is two-player games. So we do have an entire thing about um, two-player games for date night. Most of those are going to work, even if your date night's at home, at the kitchen table together. We've also got uh, cooperative games, two-player cooperative games for people who prefer co-op games. And then also gaming with kids. We've got a number of different episodes and articles at the Tabletop Bellhop blog on gaming with kids, including the best games for gaming with your kids, games to hook your kids on gaming, two-player games with kids. We even have a specific one for three-player games playing with a toddler. There are all kinds of our past episodes, basically any of our game recommendations. Look for your situation. If you have five players only, we've got an article about that. And if you've got people who you don't normally play games with, but you're trapped in that house, look at our article for gateway games to try and figure out ways yes. to introduce them into your hobby. Yeah, we do have a whole uh, list of games to hook a new gamer. So uh, we've got games for people, tile laying games, I think, for people who like dominoes. We even have one of those. So check out some of our previous game recommendations. Like I said we could probably talk all night at this point about other games are great to play when you're home. But the point is, you're stuck at home. It's not the end of the world. This is the perfect chance to sit down and play some games. And to me, it's the perfect chance to get those bigger heavier longer games those games that require the same group of people get together all the time or that take so many hours you normally can't fit them into a regular game night and as always our uh, all of our episodes that we mentioned in this episode will be linked in the show notes for quick and easy reference down down below 